that is now recording. And I'm also going to remember to share my screen so that you can see the um, see the presentation. So there we go. Um, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so today's lecture is on the Phoenicians in Sicily. Um, just before I start, that's Phoenicians with a PH, not with a V. Um, we did have somebody travel with us once who thought we were talking about the, the Venetians for the whole of the day and um, <laughs> rather got the wrong end of the stick. So Phoenicians with a PH. The Phoenicians were an ancient Semitic speaking seafaring civilization that originated in the Levant region of the Eastern Mediterranean. At its height between 1500 and 300 BC, it spread across almost the entire Mediterranean and there is evidence they ventured as far afield as Cornwall, the Azores and the Red Sea. They are credited with innovations in shipbuilding, navigation and agriculture and as inventors of the world's oldest alphabet, the precursor of our own. In Sicily, despite founding only three settlements on the west of the island, their legacy is one of the most profound and fascinating of all. So, today we go in search of the Phoenicians. Let's begin at the beginning. Where did they come from? Well, the Phoenicians were essentially the Canaanites of the Bible. Their language was a Semitic language, which um, is a family of languages which includes Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, and also Maltese. Um, and they were organized in city-states along the coast of what is modern day Lebanon and um, just up here into Syria. The most famous of their city-states was Tyre. Um, Sidon was another famous one. Two others, Veritas and Byblos, um, were also uh, important and, and famous. Um, the city-states were independent from each other and interesting enough there is no evidence that they viewed themselves as a single nationality which is in great contrast to the Greeks. The Greeks very much had an idea of being um, Greek united if nothing else by their language. It seems as if the Phoenicians didn't have this um, this, this tie between themselves. They developed an extensive maritime network that lasted for over a, uh, a millennium and they were absolutely the dominant commercial power throughout the Mediterranean. So this slide here shows you um, some of these commercial networks and the trade routes that the Phoenicians plied. What did they trade? Well, um, metals especially. Um, I think we mentioned in the um, lecture on the Greeks um, how the Greeks were very much on the lookout for things like gold and, um, and silver, but the, the Phoenicians also traded copper copper ingots that they got from Cyprus. Um, the interesting thing about this is that the Phoenicians never had a currency in the way that the Greeks had, but these, so most of the trade was done in a kind of bartering, um, but nevertheless these gold, the, sorry, these copper ingots um, functioned as a, as a kind of, of currency. They also traded gold, which they acquired from Nubia, and also silver. Also amphorae of uh, liquids, in particular oil and wine, 
precious stones, which they found from all over the, um, the Mediterranean. Timber, timber in particular from um, the Levant, of course, was famous for, for timber. And also papyrus, which came from uh, modern day Egypt. Cloth, uh, linen, again from, from um, what's now modern day Egypt and dyes. We're going to talk more about dyes later because they were uh, fundamental to Phoenician trade. Also glass, not, not glass as in windows, but small glass objects, particularly ornaments, beads, and, and so on and so forth. Perfumes, ointments, also slaves, and also um, monkeys, wherever they got those from, probably somewhere in Africa, animal hides, and last of all, salt was a very important commodity. Um, before we move on to the next slide, um, let's just have a look at this map of the Mediterranean and, and, and look at these trade roads, routes. First thing you notice is that they tend to be east-west. I mean, that's pretty much the orientation of the Mediterranean itself. Um, now, until recently, it was always thought that um, the Phoenicians traveled by day. Um, they traveled by ship. They had large ships. We'll, we'll talk more about their ships later. Um, these were essentially rowing ships. They did have sails, but they were only very rudimentary sails. And you'll notice that they kept very closely to the shores. Now, and, and hence the, the navigation by day, because they could see the shore. But actually, more recent scholarship has thrown up some very um, interesting discoveries because we realize that this was actually incorrect. Um, to start off with, travel on the Mediterranean is actually easier at night because the, the sea is, is calmer without the wind. Um, and the Phoenicians used the stars to navigate. So this was their other great invention. In fact, uh, curiously enough, the Greek, the ancient Greek for pole star was, they called it the Phoenician star. The, the Greeks knew that the Phoenicians navigated by the stars. And so the Greek, the Phoenicians started to navigate in a north south direction. You can see um, arriving in Sicily straight away from the coast of North Africa. Um, these vessels, we, we don't know for sure, but historians have calculated that they traveled around six miles an hour. So that meant that the crossing, for example, from Greece to Sicily would have taken something in the region of two weeks to, um, to take. So in other words, travel was relatively um, slow. But nevertheless, these Phoenicians got a long way. Um, you can see they got outside the Mediterranean and Diodorus, the Sicilian historian, claims that they arrived as far afield as Madeira, the Canary Islands, also, um, Cornwall, we, we, know, we know they arrived in Cornwall because we know that they went for, for tin, actually, and also the, the, the Red Sea. The other thing for which the Phoenicians are remembered today is their alphabet. Um, they were the first people to develop an alphabet. Now, um, let's just remind ourselves what we mean by an alphabet. An alphabet is where we have symbols depicting a sound or, or a phoneme to be, to be more technically correct. This is in contrast to things like hieroglyphs or pictograms or something even like cuneiform where the symbol or the picture denote, de denoted the whole word. Um, so what was the advantage of the system of having an alphabet? Well, it basically meant you could have much fewer symbols um, to uh, denote a much larger vocabulary. 
Um, and the important thing about the Phoenician alphabet is it was the precursor of the ancient Greek alphabet um, from which we get our own alphabet. And if you look at um, the Phoenician letters are obviously the ones on the left, our modern day um, letters are on the right, um, you will see some similarities. Now, um, for example, the G is the reverse of the Greek gamma. The D is very much the, um, the Greek delta. Um, the, this is very similar to, to all intents and purposes as the Greek the, theta, um, lambda, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can almost think that with a few lessons, you could even start to read Phoenician. <laughs> Um, the other curious thing, which you might have recognized already, is that there are no vowels. They didn't write down the vowels. This is in common with, for example, modern day Arabic, where they don't write down the vowels. The vowels are merely um, inferred. And Phoenician words tended to have three consonants. Um, and in this way, they're similar to, 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 to even modern day Arabic. So. Um, a noun would be would have the same three consonants as its corresponding verb. So, for example, to run and a run would be written in the same way. Um, just the vowels in the middle would, would change the inflections. So, the, in the way it was spoken. Um, and, and as I say, this is this is similar to the way um, languages, for example, Arabic and Hebrew work today. So. Um, just to go back to the previous slide to uh, look at the trade routes around um, the Mediterranean. The other very important city that the Greeks, sorry, the Greeks, the Phoenicians founded in um, 814 BC was the city of Carthage here. Um, Carthage, of course, grew to be the one of the most important Phoenician cities and the most important Phoenician city in the whole of the, the, the west of the Mediterranean. So important that um, they came to be known as not just Phoenicians, but Carthaginians. So there's an important point because when we talk about Carthaginians, we actually mean Phoenicians and vice versa. Um, and very, very often, especially when we talk about Sicily, um, in the context of Sicily, the two words are used interchangeably. <clears throat> I gather that's not technically correct. I gather there is, that there is some slight difference between them, but to all intents and purposes, um, we, we, certainly myself, we, we use the two words interchangeably. Um, I've put this map up here to show you um, the vicinity of Carthage down here in the left hand corner to the very west coast of Sicily, here. And in the middle of the 8th century BC, the Carthaginians founded a subcolony which they called Mozia. Um, Mozia was one of only three Carthaginian colonies on the island of Sicily, the other two being Palermo. Palermo was never Greek, it was Carthaginian. Um, and the other one is a place called Solontus, which is uh, just to the east of Palermo. And so essentially it's Mozia that I want to talk about today. That's going to be uh, the main body of our talk. Um, Mozia, we use, or I tend to use the Italian word for it, pronunciation mozia, but you will see other spellings of the word mozia, mozia, um, and so forth. But the pronunciation tends to remain as mozia. Um, let's just zoom in for a moment and have a look at a satellite view, this is, this is from Google, this is, this is not a Carthaginian map or anything like that, um, of the island of Mozia and get our bearings a little bit. So 
This here on the right hand side is the very western coast of Sicily. Marsala is off down to the bottom here. Trapani is um, up to the top here. This land um, on the left hand side, these are islands. Um, this one here is the Isla Longa and so forth. The sea here is very shallow. Um, in places it is only about a meter deep. Um, some places here it's a little bit deeper, but um, over to the right hand side, very, very shallow. In fact, you can even make out the, this is the bottom of the sea. This is the seabed that you can see on this part here. Um, so the interesting thing about that is that the water has a very high salinity because it's very close to the seabed and the rock here has um, a very high salinity in, in it. We'll, we'll come to this later. This is uh, important to, to the talk. And the island of Marzia is this little thing here. It's tiny. It's about 800 meters um, northwest to southeast and from north east to southwest it's about 950 meters. So tiny tiny island. I don't actually have the figures of the population of it at the height, I, mean, I don't think any of them have them, but it was extremely highly densely populated, so it was, it was important. But the other thing that I want to show you with this um, satellite view is look closely here. Can you just make that out? Can you see a line going up from the north corner there? And it did eventually arrive here. This was a road. This was how you arrived in Marcia. It was a causeway and it was a causeway that was built by the Carthaginians and it still exists today. It's underwater but it's only just underwater. Um, here it's about 30 or 40 centimeters underwater and if you know where it is you can walk from Marzia to the mainland. Um, I always used to think that it was always underwater. Um, it was a kind of secret causeway. I'm beginning to think actually that um, in Carthaginian times it probably wasn't. It probably was a proper causeway um, and that the Carthaginians actually at some time um, demolished it to, to defend their island. And we'll come on to that more in, in, in a little while. Um, nowadays there's not very much to see on Mozia. Um, but it is a very mythical island and it's a beautiful island to, to visit. It, it has a beautiful atmosphere to it. Um, just to so, show you a few pictures of it. This is the approach to Mozia as you arrive on the boat. We go on a tiny little boat, takes about 15 minutes. It's only about um, 500 meters from the shore to, to Mozia. But as you can see, there's very little when you actually get there. Um, this is an artist's impression of how Mozio might have looked under the Carthaginians. You can see just how densely packed it is. Um, and we'll talk more about what they were doing there in a short while. You can also notice the fortifications around the outside. These are just about the only parts remaining, but nevertheless, um, certainly massive fortifications, absolutely um, impregnable. Um, and look at this. This here is the um, entrance where the road arrived. Um, there would have been some sort of um, landing area here and then a huge gate area. In fact, this is about the only part that does um, exist still. Um, and over here, this is, this is interesting, this was a, a, an artificial harbour that they created. Uh, there was a gate here that you, you sailed into and it, it could become it could dry out and they could turn it into uh, pretty much a, a dry dock to, to maintain um, their boats. Um, just before I show you some more slides of Marzia, yeah, let's pause for a moment um, and just mention this 
gentleman here. Um, there's a very fascinating story behind it. I haven't got time to tell the whole story, but um, by all means, go and look it up for yourselves. Um, he was an Englishman by the name of Joseph Whittaker, uh, Pip for short. Um, Pip is short for the Italian for Joseph. Italian for Joseph is Giuseppe. Pip, Pip Whittaker. He was the nephew of some of these great dynasties, English dynasties they were, who um, founded the Marsala factories, I mean Marsala uh, wineries in the city of Marsala, and had become enormously rich um, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Pip Whittaker um, lived in Sicily. He, he actually didn't really care for the wine business, and he was much more interested in ornithology. In fact, he uh, wrote the definitive book on Tunisian birds, and he collect his collection of stuffed birds is actually still in the Natural History Museum in L London today. But the other thing that he was interested in was archaeology, and he was determined to find the Carthaginian capital on Sicily. Prior to Pitt Whittaker, nobody knew where it was. They all knew that the Carthaginians had settled in Sicily, but nobody knew where. It was he who was convinced that it was the island of Marzia, and he bought the island of Marzia. He bought the whole island. He had enough money to do that. And the island still belongs to the Whittaker Foundation, still managed by them. Um, and um, so we really have him to thank for, for saving what there is left of it. And one of the things he did do is found a small museum there, which is full of um, artifacts, which many of which he collected himself. Um, nowadays, it's true to say there is quite little left to see of, of uh, Phoenician mots. Yeah, this photograph here is the Capidaps or the, the sanctuary. Um, again, you know, not, not terribly inspiring if you were just to, to go and see that. Um, this here, this area here is the necropoli. You can just, I think, make out some uh, funerary urns. Um, probably the Phoenicians cremated the bodies and put the ashes in urns and then put a lid on the top and left them here in the necropolis. As you can see, it's very overgrown and sort of neglected, but that's what makes it so, such a fascinating island to, to visit, I, I always think. These here are the, um, these here actually the city gates, the ones I was showing you before, these ones, um, just there. Again, these are the best remains that we have. Just look how massive the, the stones are. But again, you know, it's not like a Greek temple in Agrigento. Uh, it's, it, you need to have a little bit of imagination to, to, um, to work out what's going on going on. Um, this is a rather nice sort of artist's reconstruction of Marzia. Um, and I put this here because this shows you rather nicely how this dry dock would have worked. Um, once upon a time, ships could have sailed in, would have sealed it off, and then just drained it and done work on it. And this is the dry dock today, which we call the Cothon. Um, even this photograph is actually quite an old photograph because nowadays the, the uh, University of Florence is doing some uh, archeological uh, excavations around here and they've made some quite interesting discoveries. Um, so that's really all there is left uh, of um, Carthaginian or Phoenician settlement on Marcia. So uh, in some ways, um, Presenting it to you like this in the form of a, of a lecture works very, very well because we're allowed to, to it permits us to go and dig away in, in various archives rather than sort of trudge around and, and look at, as I say, ruins that are really not very extent. So, what, what on earth were these Phoenicians doing on a tiny island on the west of Sicily? Well, 
first thing that they were doing was producing salt. Um, I mentioned earlier how the, the sea here is very, very shallow. Um, only just over a meter deep, it has a very high salinity. And in fact, if you go back to our um, aerial view, you can see these, these are the salt pans. I'm showing you in this photograph here. This was an industry that was started by the Phoenicians back in the eighth century BC. And to all intents and purposes, not very much has changed. Um, different um, what we call salt pans or salt beds here, um, which basically differ in depth and also therefore in salinity, because as the, as the water gets shallower, as the water evaporates, the salinity of the water increases um, to the extent where um, towards the end of the summer, um, it's just pure crust of salt left. And for sure, the Phoenicians would have had windmills and so forth used to pump um, water between, between the beds. Um, as the uh, water evaporated, salinity increased. Um, and they also would have used these windmills for crushing the salts to, to, to make it finer. Um, one other thing to, to point out in this photograph is the colour of the water. Uh, notice how it's different in each pan, um, that's partly because the salinity is different, but also it's the presence of um, essentially uh, what was basically an algae, um, which of course is then the, the algae that's eaten by shrimps, giving them this pink colour, and at certain times of the year we also get flamingos coming here um, eating the same, and, and that's what gives the flamingos their pink colour. So salt was an important industry here, um, goes hand in hand with tuna fishing. The Carth Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, would have caught tuna fish, tuna that arrived in the Mediterranean, um, would have swum in through the Straits of Gibraltar. Imagine swimming in through the Straits of Gibraltar, carrying on in a straight line. The first thing you, you meet is um, the, this this western corner of Sicily, the Phoenicians would have caught the tuna and of course very conveniently the salt would have been used for um, preserving the fish. But uh, that probably doesn't explain the enormous richness and importance of Mozia in itself. I mentioned earlier that uh, the Phoenicians traded in dyes they did trade in dyes, they also produced those dyes. And the most famous dye that they produced was um, a purple dye, a, a, a dye that actually gives its, its name um, to, to the colour. We call it Tyrian purple from, um, from, from, the, um, from the city Tyre, if you remember if we go back to our, our slide back at the beginning, uh, Tyre here was one of their important cities. Um, how did they produce this purple dye? It's an extraordinary story. It comes from um, basically this shellfish here, which is a kind of whelk. Um, the Latin name is Bolinus brandaris, which used to be, when Linnaeus first termed it, it was called Murex brandaris, which is why many people today refer it as the Murex shell, um, although technically that's no longer correct. Um, and the Phoenicians worked out that the, the shellfish which, which lived in this thing produced a secretion and collecting this secretion and crushing it down and mixing it with clay produced the purple dye, purple colour dye, which produced this. Now, the quantities of shells, or whelks, that you would need to produce this dye were quite incredible. It's been calculated that 12,000 of these snails would have yielded 1.4 grams of 
pure dye. Now that dye would, would have been enough to dye the trim of a garment. So in other words, you needed a lot of shells. Um, how did you pro um, collect this dye? Well, sorry, the, the, the secretion. Well, there were two methods. You either milked the snails, I mean, which sounds a, an extremely painful process, um, or you crushed them. But of course, if you crushed them, the, the snails died and, and wouldn't produce any more. So of course, and the ideal method was to, to milk them. And of course, this color purple, purely because of the sheer labor that went into producing it, um, meant that it was extremely valuable. And this was the royal purple, which existed all the way through Greek times, all the way through Roman times, Byzantine times, um, and in fact, the last factories producing this Tyrian purple um, were, were the factories in Constantinople, uh, which vanished in 1453 with the destruction of Constantinople, the fall of Constantinople to the, um, to the Muslims. Um, qualities of this purple, why was it so sought after? Why did they go to all these great lengths to um, create this purple dye? It didn't fade, was the simple answer. And in fact, they say that with time, the color got stronger. Um, one other final curiosity about this, the Greek name for this color uh, was Finiki. And that is where we get our name Phoenician. Um, if you remember, Going back to the beginning of the talk, I said that these city-states didn't have a common identity. It was the Greeks who gave them their common identity. It was the Greeks who called them Phoenicians. Extraordinary concepts, if you think about it. Um, the Carthaginians, of course, worshipped their own gods. Um, not going to talk an awful lot about Carthaginian gods. Uh, but very, very simply, uh, the supreme god was El. Uh, the son of El was Baal. They had a fertility goddess, Astarte. And in Carthage, there was another goddess who was linked to Astarte called Tanat. And these gods and goddesses were very often um, depicted on uh, the funerary monuments. Um, one slightly unsavory thing about the, the Carthaginians is that, um, and certainly it's true on Mozia, we think we found evidence of this, um, it is said that they sacrificed babies. Um, we don't really know whether these babies, it could be that they were stillborn, um, it could be it was the firstborn child um, to produce a long lineage or something, we don't know, and there's a lot of academic discussion about that but we have found evidence of this also on, um, on, on, on Mozia as well. Um, finally, I want to talk about a really fabulous um, Carthaginian exhibit, which um, we have in the museum in Marsala. And this is the remains of a Phoenician ship dating, we think, from um, to around 240, 241 BC. If that is correct, it is the oldest warship in the world. Um, it was discovered in around, it was discovered in 1970 by um, an American archaeologist on a frost and it was preserved and it is now exhibited in this wonderful museum in Marsala. Um, all that we've got left is the timbers of it and a few of the nails and the rivets. Um, they've created this um, metal frame to give you some idea of the dimensions of this ship. Um, we think it was about 35 meters in length, uh, 
it would have had 17 banks of oars. Now, the Phoenician ships were biremes, they had double banks of oars, so one sitting above another. And this part of the ship that remains is the stern of the ship. You can just see here um, the model of the, the boat here. Um, an extraordinary find. Now, how do we know it was a, a warship and not a, a merchant ship, for example? Well, um, had it been a merchant ship, almost undoubtedly, there would have been amphora um, inside the wreck, um, carrying oil or whatever. Um, none of these were found. Instead, what were found were animal bones. So animal bones of things like deer, sheep, goats, oxen, meaning that um, these were the things that the sailors would have, eaten, would have eaten and then tossed the bone away. And they also found small um, drinking cups that they had been passed around to give the sailors something to, to drink. Um, but the other extraordinary find, and in fact it's displayed in this case here, um, are some stems of marijuana. <laughs> and they think that the captains would have given this marijuana to the uh, sailors as they rode into battle to, um, you know, to, to, to lessen the pain that they felt, if you like, as they, as they, um, as they rode into battle. So um, finally, before we, before we finish the talk, I want to talk a little bit about how the, um, the Phoenicians met their end. Well, of course, this was in the famous Punic Wars. Um, actually, indeed, even the very word Punic comes from Phoenician. And these were the battles um, that began in the third century, 264 BC was the very first battle between the Romans and the Phoenicians. The very, very first battle actually took place off the coast of Milazzo, on the northern coast of Sicily. Um, in 264, as I said, but the most famous battle and the most decisive battle of all of the first Punic Wars, there were three sets of Punic Wars, as you'll remember from history, but the first one, end of the first one, was the Battle of the Egeri Islands. Now, the Egeri Islands are these islands here, three islands off the coast of Sicily. And the, the battle, we think, took place somewhere here between, um, between the shore of Sicily and <clears throat> Favignana. And indeed, um, it is believed that this um, ship was quite probably one of the Phoenician ships sunk in that battle. Um, and in fact, that ties up with the carbon dating evidence that we have since acquired. Um, so let's, let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about these naval battles. How did, how did they, um, how did they happen? Um, this picture here is a picture that's on the wall in the museum in Marsala and it gives you a very good idea of how these battles would have taken place. Essentially the two navies would have lined up facing each other. Um, the ships as you can see are very very similar um, in fact, the Romans probably copied the Phoenician ships. Uh, they copied the design, as it were. Um, you can see, just, you can see, for example, the double banks of oars along the side. You'll also notice that some of them have a sail. Most of them have got, they've all got a mast. Some of them have got a sail up. The sail was a square sail. So it only it was only any use with the wind behind you. You couldn't use it for sailing uh, towards the wind, which is why presumably some of these ships don't have their sail up. Uh, there's a slightly figurative picture, I think, this one. Um, the other thing to note is the prow. Now this, um, notice how they have this sort of pointed prow, both the Roman ships and the Phoenician ships. The technique of battle in these times was essentially that the 
commander would give the order for the battle to commence and the two navies would simply row towards each other as fast as possible and at the very last minute just as they got past each other as it were they were just about to cross each other the idea was to turn your ship to get the battering ram into the side of the enemy ship now these battering rams as i said it's a slightly incorrect picture here because these battering rams were actually underneath the water and the idea was simply to puncture the enemy ship um, and the enemy ship would let in water and sink that was pretty much the entire technique of battle um, over the course of time it they, they varied it a little bit you can see <clears throat> um, fire here I, I, they did set fire to each other's ships I, they didn't have what was called greek fire they, they didn't have catapults that slung sort of um, shots of, of fire at, at, at each other's ships so slightly wrong i think in that sense um, but one of the techniques that the romans um, uh, invented was this thing here now this was called a corvus uh, basically from the word crow and it was a kind of ladder that as the enemy ship got near they would let it down and it would be had a big spike on the end that ran into the enemy ship and then it, as i said it was a kind of ladder or a bridge to board the enemy ship now um one of the questions very good questions actually is, is the the oarsmen were they chained in or not um i think the answer is if they were slaves they were chained in if they were paid soldiers they weren't but the difference being if you were chained in and the ship was going to sink you would you would drown basically um and there's therein lies a good incentive not to allow your ship to to be punctured and drown um so the romans certainly did have you can see here um, soldiers aboard their ship with the idea that they would board an enemy ship but the basic technique of, of, of the battle was simply to ram the enemy ship and and sink it and so the corollary of all of this was that um the general or leader of the, the army or navy or whatever you want to call them basically had very little control over the course of the battle once they uh, blew the starting whistle the, the battle commenced and and it, it it carried on until until all the enemy ships were, were sunk basically but notice also the eye uh, painted on the ship um, think about it this is something a tradition that carries on into the Mediterranean today even in you see this in boats in Turkey and even in, in Malta as well um, some of the other things that we have in the museum in in Marsala we we have some of the it was called a rostrum in, it was the Latin name for, for this battering ram at the front of the ship this particular one is a Phoenician one in fact you can see it's damaged so quite possibly it um, it was actually used in battle they were made of bronze um, and obviously these are the things that didn't didn't rot away once the ship timbers of the tip ship rotted away so we actually have quite a nice collection of these um, curiously the Carthaginians inscribed the name of their god on here the Romans inscribe the name of the person that paid for it so you can even tell which ones are roman and which ones are carthaginian and very very finally um i think it would be amiss not to finish on um going back to the museum on the island of marzia um the most famous exhibit is actually this um which is actually not phoenician or carthaginian at all it, it's greek it's a Greek st marble statue dating from the 5th century BC um, and, and we can identify the, 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 the source of the marble it comes from the Peloponnese not from Sicily at all very very fine marble very beautifully carved um, found in the 1980s on Mozia we don't know who it is and nor do we know who the um, artist was that carved it 
but we think it is a charioteer. You can see he probably had a, a gold band across his chest. This is where he would have been attached to a chariot. Um, this hand, he was probably holding the reins of the chariot. And on his head, he probably had a helmet, uh, which we've lost. Or quite possibly it's been looted. And it probably was made of gold and it, we've lost it. And similarly, a sort of protection for his, his nose as well. Um, so he's known as the young man of, of Marzia. Um, in fact, for a while, a couple of years ago, he was in the British Museum, if any of you got to see him. But uh, a beautiful statue nonetheless, but not, alas, a uh, Phoenician. But um, the Phoenician probably captured him from somewhere and brought him back to Marzia at some stage. Well, um, I think my time is up. So um, we will, I will unmute you and we can have some questions if you would like. So um, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Anybody who would like to ask a question, fire away. Okay, who, who do we have? Wave your hands or um, shout out loud if Hi. you have a question to ask. Hi. Alan, uh, yeah, yeah, Alan? Uh, um, the question I was going to ask actually is, are you going to extend these lectures to do your uh, Southern Italian uh, uh, thing? <laughs> absolutely, your... absolutely we are, yes. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's absolutely the, the case. Um, I, I, um, set up these eight lectures as just being on Sicily um, because I thought that they would be the most popular topics. Um, I think we'll probably have a break throughout uh, August and goodness me in September and October we might even run some trips um, but certainly through through the winter November and, and December very much uh, the idea is to extend these talks to talk about southern Italy, Malta, Greece and also other places that we go to, maybe even Armenia and Georgia and so forth. So, oh, great. absolutely, thank you for prompting me <laughs> to to mention. That. Yes. Anybody else with a question? Damien. Hi. Yes. And, Who, Andrew here. I can't see um, you. It's Andrew. Okay. Andrew. Nice. Andrew. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yes. Now I can. Hi. Yes. Um, you mentioned that at the start of your talk that the influence of the Phoenicians on Sicily was huge. But you've only mentioned, I think, three colonies on the western coast. Now, did they intermingle with the local population, crossbreed, or, or no? No, they didn't. How so, do you I mean, that, how do you yes, sort of uh, yes. enlarge that I statement? Verify that statement exactly. You're quite right. Um, the the influence was purely um, on the industries, the industries of uh, tuna fishing and salt. Uh, which went on to be the great industries of, of Western Sicily and continued to be so, well, continue to be so even, even to today. Um, uh, so it's purely that. But they, it's interesting, they didn't, most of the time they were at war with the Greeks, so they didn't mingle with the Greeks at all. The only people with whom we think they had a good relationship were the Elimians. Now the Elimians, we don't, I don't think we're really going to touch on them in these talks. We briefly did when, when I showed you the picture of the Temple of Segesta, because they lived in Segesta and a couple of um, the hill towns around, um, around Marsala. But otherwise, you know, we, we don't really come into them. So, so no, they didn't intermingle at all. Uh, their influence was purely economical. And it's through right, but good question, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Damien. Peter, yes, good morning, nice to see you. It's like an immense project to get that amount of stone over to Mozia to build all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, it's a few centuries later, it's all disappeared again. Well, abso absolutely. I mean, actually, that's a very good point, and I, I didn't really um, cover it at all. Um, because, I mean, for I mean, in contrast, if you remember when we talked about Agrigento and we talked about the temples, we, we saw how the stone was quarried exactly where the temples were built. 
here on Motsia, there was no stone. So you're quite right, it all had to be built, brought across, across that causeway that I showed you. An absolutely phenomenal um, job. And unfortunately, I haven't got a photograph and I, I, it's a shame that I haven't got a photograph. I'm kicking myself and next time I go to Motsia, I'll take one. Because the Phoenicians didn't have cement or at least not on Motsia, they were credited with inventing cement actually, but, um, but the way that, the, that these blocks of stone join together in some places is absolutely incredible, the way that they cut these blocks of stone. So um, thank you for reminding me about that, Peter. Very, very important point. Thank you. Yeah. Next question, anybody? How shallow was the draft of the ship? Janet, Janice. Oh, how nice, nice to see you, yes. Um, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, good question. Uh, well, they were quite shallow, these ships. Um, I mean, I can't give you an exact figure. I'm guessing a couple of metres. But um, therein lies something that I didn't mention in the talk and, and perhaps should have mentioned. So most of the time, especially of course if it was a merchant ship, these ships would have been weighted down with the, 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 the merchandise that they were carrying, which was essentially was amphora, um, usually of wine or something and so on. If it was a, a, a warship, it didn't have that, um, that, that ballast, so they had to use metal or something else, these, these ingots that I mentioned. But the interesting thing here is that the Phoenicians are also credited with inventing the keel on the bottom of the ship, which gave the ship greater stability. Um, and the Romans only acquired this technology a little bit later on. So in the early battles, the Phoenicians very much had a, an advantage over the Romans in, in this respect. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Anybody else? Next question. Yeah. Um, after you. Who's, who's this? Martin. Martin, is that you? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to come back to the imported stone that was used. Do we know where the quarries were? Um, well, yes, the quarries, the, the, yes, we do know where the quarries are. The quarries are all around, um, around the hinterland of Marsala. And in fact, you still see them today and they're still, they are still quarried. Um, yes, I mean, we don't, we didn't, we don't visit them. The other place where there is a quarry, um, very nice quarry, is on the island of Favignana, one of the three Egeri Islands. Um, it was a it was a soft tufa stone, all of the all of this stone. So unfortunately, it, it hasn't weathered, which is why which is why the the, the walls are, are no longer. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Very, it is local. Yeah. Hello. Yes, um, Charles. Charles, nice to see you. Do Do we know what wood was used uh, in the ship? The one in the museum, maybe we. Yes, yes, we do um, know what wood there is. Um, there were three different woods timbers used um, and I'm going to struggle to name all three. <laughs> One of them is Asa. Now I'm not sure quite what, I'm not even quite sure what sure that wood is, but that's what definitely one of them. The other one uh, was cedar. Of course, cedar, cedar that, I mean, is, is, um, that came obviously from the Levant. And the third wood I don't know, and I, I, I would guess, but it, it's a, it's a hard wood, I know, and I, I can't remember whether it's an, an oak okay. or an elm, but it, it, it's fairly easily Googleable. But there were three, yeah. three woods, and th but the other point about that, Charles, is that different pieces of wood, different types of wood, were used for different pieces of the structure of of the ship. Yes, so the planking was one type, the uh, skeleton of, of the of the boat was for another type of wood, and, and okay. so forth. Yeah. Um, who's next? Do we have any more? I think we've got time for one can or two more questions. Damien, can I just ask one question? Robert, because yes, my wife yes. and I are really considering going to Sicily um, right at the end of August and through yes. September. Yes. Um, 
the flights booked, the accommodations booked, would you consider that it is a safe place? I mean, inverted commas, safe. I, I think so, absolutely. Um, I, I think somebody else asked this question a few weeks ago. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I would I would have no qualms. I mean, um, I personally, I'm, I'm hoping to go back at the end of August, personally, and I would have no, no qualms about even getting on an airplane um, and, and, and going to, to Sicily. Um, I mean... I, I, they've got outside, outside restaurants yes. um, and clean accommodation. It, absolutely, and Ex exactly. I mean, the, the, this is the lovely thing about Sicily is that everything goes on outdoors. So all the restaurants, you don't even need to go inside a restaurant. You can sit outside all of the time. And the other thing that they've done in the hotels in Sicily is that they've cut down the number of guests that they're allowed to accommodate at any one time. So, um, and they, they've made, made it very, very clear, you know, which, which is the entrance, which is the exit. And also, I know Sicilians, they are absolutely fastidious about keeping things clean. So things like vehicles, all of the vehicles are cleaned daily. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, you know, that's by law, they have to do that. Um, personally, I think you're safer there than you are here. It's as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else got one last question? I think we've got time for. Um, otherwise, I think we might um, go off and have lunch <laughs> just after right. midday. So perfect. Thank you time. very much. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, Next week's lecture is on um, the Baroque in Sicily. Now, um, in other words, Baroque architecture. So I'll be talking, I'll be giving you a bit more of a guided tour of some of the beautiful cities of Noto, Ragusa, uh, Modica, Scicli, um, and so forth. And um, so in other words, it, it's basically the southeast of the island. Any of you who've been down there, will recognize that it's beautiful, beautiful architecture. And of course, it has to be said, it is where all of the Montalbano series was filmed. So you'll see places that you recognize from those films. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this morning. And I'll look forward to joining you next week. And we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Damien. Okay. A, wonderful, a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you all soon. Have a nice Bye. lunch. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.